engaging. In fact, we have two such sessions. One is today, and the second one is tomorrow morning. My name is Monika Lanzenberger. I'm from the European Commission. In particular, I'm the head of sector for research coordination in the unit on e-health, well-being, and aging. Um, I'm going to show you just uh, two topics quickly, and then the main purpose of this session is actually that you can do networking, that you might find perhaps potential partners um, for proposals that you might want to submit in April. These two topics that uh, we discuss in this session uh, one research innovation action in particular it's uh, DTH 01 2019 um, which is big data and artificial intelligence for monitoring health status and quality of life after the cancer treatment and the second one is a coordination support action uh, in particular it's about uh, support for the large scale uptake of open service platforms in the active and healthy aging domain. Now, let me quickly go to the first topic. Um, when you look at the work program text, and of course my presentation does not at all replace a very thorough reading of the work program, because the work program is the only legally binding text. So every word that you see in the work program is really important. Now, the slides are just um, a, a short summary of this. When we look at a specific challenge, um, it starts from uh, the basis that can't uh, today, and, and we, are, we are lucky about that, very often has become a kind of chronic disease, and it does not necessarily need uh, um, that the patient die from the cancer. So we have many more people who have been diagnosed the cancer, who had treatments against cancer, and um, survived this for a very long time. Now what we see as well there is um, that the treatments against cancer, this uh, medication, can be very aggressive. And uh, also in combination with the uh, psychological um, with the stress, with the depression and so on that patients very often develop, um, it can lead to long-term after-cure consequences. And what we would like to do in this topic, to monitor these patients, to make use of all the data in order to better help them uh, to avoid such after-cure uh, negative um, impacts. So we want to prevent as much as possible these long-term effects and um, also in um, the frequency and the intensity of the symptoms that they develop afterwards could be because of treatments or because of the cancer or because of other uh, diseases, conditions that would be combined, that this frequency and intensity is um, lowered. So. Um, we want to make use of big data in this field. So when we go to the scope, you see that we want to look at the big data, the data that is available there. On the one hand, and I think I have this on the next slide, and I'm, I'm going forward because it fits better. On the one hand, we look into traditional sources of health data. So it can be clinical data, registries from hospitals, um, standard medical data. On the other hand, we want to look into new sources of health data, so data that the patients collect themselves, for example, by any mobile devices or a new type of sensors. And in addition to that, also sources that were perhaps not directly meant to monitor uh, this, the status, the health status of a patient, but that give information about the environment, for example. So we want to have a broader view on what type of, um, what type of um, pressure, environmental pressure, for example, um, is uh, put on this patient. Of course, needless to say that you always need to observe the legal, <laughs> legal, uh, uh, legalization in this area to not uh, combine data that you're not allowed to combine. 
So the purpose of the data in a, in a way must be open to that, and especially if it's personalized data, if it's sensitive data, you, you need to be very much aware of that. Um, also, it's necessary to involve stakeholders in this field, not only the patients and the doctors, but also the family, and um, to an appropriate extent also the wider public, so it might be other uh, stakeholders where you uh, see that it's good to involve them because uh, it's also about um, costs related to such, um, such treatments after cancer and so on. So we want to um, look at socioeconomic aspects in this field as well. Um, on this slide, I mentioned the health economic issues because of course we know that chronic diseases also come with certain health costs for the health systems and it's important to have sustainable health systems. But in addition to that, it should also be so-called patient-reported outcome or experience measures and other uh, data in this field. Now, when I quickly go back um, about um, this big data, it's about acquiring, about managing, about sharing, about processing, modeling this data. So that means uh, also the metadata is very important there and the quality of the metadata is also important. High, perform high performance computing can be used where you think it's appropriate to be used. So it's not about developing a high performance computing infrastructure, it's rather about using uh, existing high performance in, uh, if it's useful. I think I mentioned already Legal issues, of course, on top of that, security, privacy issues are very important. Also, gender aspects should be taken into account because it's individual, individuals that um, suffer from these uh, from this post-cancer treatments. Let me quickly go to the expected impacts. As you normally see always in our topics, we want you to describe key performance indicators, how you measure the progress towards that impact. Uh, the impact should not be confused with the, with the results or the outcome of the project as such. So the deliverables that need to be achieved during the project is one thing. The expected impacts may be reached only a long time or sometime after the end of the project. But still, we want to measure the progress towards this impact, therefore it's necessary that you, that you include uh, such specific indicators. Um, we want to understand then whether this data that is collected is really useful in order to help to improve the quality of life of these patients, also uh, to prevent or already early detect medical conditions that might come with the treatments. Um, so there is a lot on the quality of life for the patients, but of course it's also on, on the data, so to, to what extent this data is interoperable, to what extent you can reuse it, and so on, because uh, data that needs to be collected all the time from scratch is also very expensive. So reuse uh, is important there. Um, emerging data-driven analytics is mentioned there, and you can see in the title, artificial intelligence. So when we mention in the topic text, analytics, we actually expect something in the direction of artificial intelligence. But of course, uh, it's not, uh, it should not be understood as a buzzword, but it should be really something that makes sense in, uh, in the field for analyzing this type of data. Now we have some uh, more expected impacts. Maybe just let me mention that um, health inequalities should also be addressed. So this type of action should not increase the health inequality, but should uh, give uh, access to everyone uh, in the same way. Um, comorbidities is uh, also an important point. So with that, um, I gave a very short summary, and of course, make sure you read the text in detail. Um, the expected EU contribution is between three and five million for this type of research and innovation action, and uh, the threshold um, is 12 overall, and for the excellence and the impact four, as it normally is for the research innovation action, 
entry for the implementation action. You find uh, some information in the participants portal. You will also see that the participants portal is now replaced by a new uh, portal. Um, but I'm not sure if I should directly uh, recommend that you always immediately go to the new portal. I'm, I myself uh, saw that it was a little bit slow today. So I still prefer the old participants portal because the information is uh, at the moment still very reliable there. Now the second topic that I want to quickly mention is the coordination support action which is about the uptake of the open uh, service platforms. And there um, we start from the assumption or we see that a number of such open service platforms have already been developed. It's not about developing new uh, types of uh, standards there. And this can come from the medical domain, it can, can come from the independent living or assisted living domain, uh, and also in the field of IoT. And let me just mention two that are probably widely known is Universal and Fiverr. Those two are also directly referred to in the topic text. And there, um, the challenge of this topic is to really, to really analyze what are the potential obstacles to the uptake of such open service platforms and what are the real benefits because um, we think that uh, this type of platforms should normally lower the development costs. Reusing uh, this type of information means that um, the components can be reused and so on, should come together with um, also an economic advantage for those who make use of this type of information. So interoperability is not only understood as a technical term there, but also uh, from the economic perspective. And the question is, how do those um, open service platforms actually contribute to the development of a scalable and open market for digital solution for, for health and aging? Um, when we look at the scope, I mentioned already Universal and Fiverr, but you are not limited to open service platforms. It can also be partly open or proprietary platforms that, developed, uh, that are developed from industries. Of course, it should be considered under which conditions um, those platforms can be used. And um, if it's also a sustainable solution and um, you can expect whether it will be compatible also in 10 years from now or from a longer time from now. Um, we, the, the applicant should actually develop a methodology to monitor such open pl platforms. That means to also come up with meaningful KPIs that you would uh, apply and also to put this methodology into practice. So to really study the, the open platforms that are available and, um, and see, collect data from those open platforms and um, also develop guidelines on how this type of socioeconomic costs and benefits can be measured. Um, it's about best practices. It's about fostering also the knowledge exchange among those who use these platforms, who develop these platforms, the communities um, around those platforms. And uh, it should also be linked to the relevant policy initiatives. So in the, in the call text, you will see the blueprint um, for digital transformation of health and care, but this was just an example. You can uh, look at, um, for example, a more recent policy uh, file was the communication on digital transformation of health and care or other policy files that you can, that you think are relevant in this field. It's also about collaboration. So the consortium that is selected, um, it's a coordination support action. That means in the end only one uh, proposal is normally successful. The consortium that is selected is meant also to collaborate with uh, the platforms with the people that develop and use these platforms and to disseminate uh, also the information from this in particular in big events around such topics. Now the expected impacts. I think it's already quite clear that we want to see whether these platforms are really useful. If we can measure how useful they are, 
um, or if they have actually shortcomings and it ma doesn't make so much sense to, to really apply them. And then uh, it's the reasons uh, for those uh, shortcomings should also be identified. And the engagement with stakeholders is of course important. Um, there is a, a bit more also on general type of uh, expected income. So networking, knowledge exchange I already mentioned, also how to um, implement policy files in this field. So we want to bring basically policy also to to the real application fields by looking at such open service platform. And the purpose is to help with the scaling up of these digital solutions because we see that so, so much has already been done and we want to go the next step basically. Um, here the maximum EU contribution is 1.5 million and as normal in coordination support action the overall threshold is 10 and it's three for all the three criteria. Um, just one general type of information. The deadline is the 24th of April 2019, so there is still plenty of time for networking. Uh, just don't wait um, until the 24th of April to submit the proposal because as you know, we always have some issues in the last two hours before the deadline because everyone uh, wants to submit the very last moment. Um, you also might want to look at the finished and ongoing projects that we have uh, in Society Challenge 1. You can find the link on this slide because you can get an idea what type of projects have been funded in the past. And um, also the work program, just a little reminder that only there you find the legally binding text. So with this, um, I end my presentation for now. Um, if you have questions, we can take a few questions now, but of course, you can now think about questions and uh, contact me in future and also the topic coordinators that are responsible for these topics through the email address that you find here. Um, so once we finish with the questions, the next step in this uh, short session will be that uh, the presenters who have uh, submitted um, their short idea introduce themselves quickly. I think we have six presentations now. Um, let me first ask quickly, are there any direct questions that you want to ask? Yes, please. I'm not sure if we have a microphone, so maybe we do have. <laughs> so I would like to ask about definition of after treatment. Does it mean patients that still receive treatment or patients that don't receive treatment anymore? Okay, so it means that as soon as someone has been diagnosed a cancer, uh, and then it's not important if they still receive treatment or if they are seen as healthy and don't need any treatment more anymore. So the point really is as soon as they have been diagnosed once a cancer. And what kind of validation is expected? RCTs, proof of concepts? We normally do not uh, expect our RCTs or randomized controlled trials. Uh, this is more in the topics that are managed by our colleagues in the GRTD where it's really a, a very strong type of validation that you would do in a hospital. Uh, we expect a proof of concept indeed, like we usually do for technological solutions. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Uh, <coughs> do you have some practical definition of big data in mind in this <laughs> call. <laughs> so about the definition of big data. So I'm sure that this question has been asked probably 1,000 or even more often times uh, in the past 10 years because big data is like actually not such a new, uh, such a new um, thing that we only see now. So no, we do not uh, limit the data. We, we give a, a certain type of sources that we think you look into it. Um, we do not say that it, it has to be that type of heterogeneity, it has to be that type of, uh, 
of number of records or so. This we don't, we don't say here. We understand the big data in particular about combining these different sources and going beyond the traditional medical sources. Above, on top of that, you will not find any restrictions in the topic text. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I also wonder, do you expect of proposers uh, to have pre-existing data? Uh, do you expect them to collect data within the project, a bit of both? Yes, um, we also expect that data would be collected within, within the project because we think that this type of combination, using on the one hand normal sources from registries and so on, then um, additional new type of sources like mobile devices or other type of sensors, and even additional, let's say, uncommon type of sources, for example, environment that you typically will not have already at hand this type of data. So there is for sure also some activity about collecting data, but it should not only be collecting data from scratch. So you should make use of existing data certainly as well. Okay. Now I, I think a challenge is to get existing data on quality of life. Data on cancer, sure, there is lots of it, but quality of life after treatment specifically is challenging, I think. Yes, so there you will see that for some type of data it will be quite easy or let's say at least standard to acquire this type of data and for other type of data. And this I would say is um, where the proposal should go beyond the state of the art also because it's research that is expected here that combining these different type of sources and doing the analysis and doing also the proof, the validation that uh, this type of uh, data really can help for the patient is, I would say, one of the core ac uh, elements where it go, should go beyond the state of the art. Thanks. Other questions? I think there was one. Uh, so in this project, um, you expect us to combine big data and AI and do some predictions based on both existing data and also it includes the collection of data. Uh, so given the budget of three to five million and the scope and expected impacts, they're, they're not matching. It's up right? to the applicants to make it matching. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> because, because you were asking also to collect the data and health data is not that easy. And especially after the cancer treatment, uh, it takes longer time, sometimes even two to three years to collect sufficient data to make predictions using AI so on, on such data. So, so that, that, yeah, indeed, that means uh, we, we speak from a, a typical project here, two, three, four years approximately. We, we are not limiting the years. We can also see a project that is a bit longer than four years, but we would certainly not uh, have projects that are really kind of long-term studies. So I see the, exactly the <coughs> challenge that you mentioned here, and that means there must be some, some trade-off that you do in the projects in order to decide where you use existing data, where you need to use existing data, um, and how far you can go with this. And also, if we can ask even higher budget than what this mentioned yes. there, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so this is the situation, of course, for all topics. Yeah. In all the topics, we always say that this would be the expected EU contribution, but if a proposal has very good reasons, why they ask for a higher budget, it's really up to the applicants to decide and to make the, the budget and the tasks and the outcomes matching with what is expected in the topic. Any other questions? There's one more. Uh, as far as uh, SE1 DTH, what is the optimal uh, type of coordinator for these proposals? Uh, a hospital, a large industry, or an academy? We really don't give any advice. So that's, that's up to the consortium to decide who has the best abilities to manage such a project. Because you would look at the tasks that are assigned to a coordinator, and then when you when you submit a proposal, we have the criterion three, which is on the implementation, and there is also a criterion on the quality 
of the consortium and to what extent they bring together the expertise. So there you, you need to argue in the proposal why you think that this coordinator together with this other type of partners is exactly the right consortium. So there is certainly no limitation on the type as such. We are not saying it can only be a hospital, or it can only be a company, or it can only be a university. Uh, that's really up to the, to the consortium to make that uh, decision. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other urgent questions, I would propose that we start now with the six presentations that we received. Um, I know that we have maximum five minutes or so per per presenter, and therefore I ask you to, to respect the time. Now, we just uh, open the first presentation, please. So it doesn't actually matter which file you take. You can take the file with the, the oldest file. So no, normally we should see um, from the University of Applied Science and Sciences and Art, Arts Western Switzerland, and the colleague who submitted who submitted uh, this presentation was uh, Jean-Paul Calvimont. Can you please uh, come forward um, and we show the slides? No, that's not the slide. So the file uh, that we would like to see is eHealth Unit Profile. It's a PDF document.
finally. Hi, my name is Jean-Paul Calvimonte. So I, I, I present the eHealth unit, which is part of the University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Western Switzerland, which happens to be the second largest university in, in the country. So we have experience in lots of uh, EU projects, uh, FP7, H2020, in different domains that I, I want to present. So first thing is our data acquisition unit. So we basically uh, provide researchers, for example, in physiotherapy, with uh, tools like REDCap and also DMP support. And recently we have also started to offer an applied ethics service, uh, all, always in the health domain. We have also started uh, recently a living lab of handicap. So we test new technologies with people with disabilities. Like here we have an example of this wheelchair that people drive with the eyes. So this is an interesting collaboration with the Swiss uh, Paraplegic Foundation. In terms of uh, technical expertise, uh, deep learning, we have worked a lot on annotation of data, uh, automatic learning of models, and interpretability. A lot of application, especially in histopathology. Also, uh, we have provided uh, 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 resources for scientific challenges. So we, pr we support uh, very strongly uh, open science. So what we do is we provide the software so that people don't need to move data around, especially health data, which is very sensitive. So people submit algorithms, they run, and so we can do reproducibility with these kind of platforms. We have run several EU projects uh, using this. Uh, we also uh, have expertise in medical image analysis and multimodal data analysis, for example, signal image processing, uh, special emphasis on cancer and lung diseases. And also concerning multimodal data analysis, this means that we combine several, several different types of input like uh, signals, images, also clinical data. We put it together using some well-known methodologies and uh, AI techniques. We have very interesting use cases with prosthetic hands and uh, use, usage of electromyography for, this, uh, for these applications, also in cancer as well. Uh, we also have expertise in intelligent agents for personalized health. So one thing that, is, that we, we have worked quite a lot is on physical ther uh, therapies for and during and after treatment. So one, one example is during cancer, after people with cancer are diagnosed, it has been seen that physical therapies can play a very big role on this. So we have done a very uh, extensive state of the art on this topic. And uh, finally, we have uh, support for chatbots. We have developed chatbots for different uh, health support applications. Well, the biggest example is uh, for stop smoke cessation. So we deploy this in uh, social networks like Facebook. We have uh, already tested this with large numbers of, of users, hundreds of users in all Switzerland with very promising results. And finally, uh, well, blockchain is a pretty much everywhere. We have worked uh, mainly on constant management and exchange of medical data. And, and some topics that are kind of uh, horizontal for our uh, projects are data streaming processing, uh, real times, and semantic stream data management. Uh, when we work with sensors, there's a lot of real time data that, that is going on. And the semantization of data, which is key for mainly most of the topics that I have uh, presented before. So that's the presentation. You can find this on the website of the ICT site. You can have all the contacts and the links to all our unit uh, services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I ask also the presenter to please stay in the room after this um, end of the session so that uh, potential uh, people that are interested in collaborating with you can still find you here in the room. Now, the next uh, presentation that we would like to see is from uh, Norway. I think there's a, com a company called Digital Norway. Um, and um, the presenter is Gupta Udata. I think you had many, many slides. I ask you to please yeah, keep I mean, uh, go in the just middle five of minutes. Yes. Yes. So is the next, uh, is, the, is it for the slide? Digital, Digital Norway, Digital Norway is the file name. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gupta Urada. Uh, I work uh, at two organizations, Oslo Cancer Cluster and also at Digital Norway. At Oslo Cancer Cluster, I work as director dealing with digital health projects and EU initiatives. 
So I will skip the slides like requested. So this is the campus of uh, Oslo Cancer Cluster Innovation Park. Uh, we are a member-based organization where we also do research and technology development. Uh, we have University Hospital and also Cancer Research Institute and Norwegian Cancer Registry and several pathology laboratories and also companies in our facility. So all, even the investors are also sitting in the same facility. So it's all at one place. Uh, we also have a high school on the ground floor uh, so that uh, we collaborate with the high school students too. Uh, we have a funny project with them where we ask the high school students to train machine learning algorithms in Norwegian. So these algorithms can also understand health data that are in Norwegian. So we are a fully operational digital innovation hub. We are on a smart specialization platform. We have several collaborations. Uh, for example, uh, with the Norwegian Cancer Registry and also Lauren Silvermore Lab uh, in developing supercomputing facilities. We have a digital pathology project where we use machine learning and AI techniques uh, in uh, cancer pathology images so that we can predict whether a patient has cancer or not just by analyzing the images. Uh, we are also heavily involved with IBM Watson and also European Union Innovation Projects and the Norwegian Cancer Genomic Consortium is also within our network. And the reason why we are heavily investing in uh, digital health is because uh, it changes uh, the way we treat cancer and also it enables us to see new patterns, especially nowadays where you have several omics, both at the research institutes and also in the hospitals. Different departments are generating a lot of data and the only way to tackle is using uh, digital innovation. And it is also a reality in biopharma and health. As you can see, this uh, image, uh, healthcare is only better than agriculture and hunting in terms of uh, digitalization. So there is a lot of work to do, especially as uh, we already mentioned, because of the sensitive nature of the health data. We need to have uh, algorithms uh, and also technologies like blockchain or DLTs for secure data transfer that will uh, remove the walls and the barriers and enable us to develop that um, personalized medicine strategies, for example. So we can use AI and big data in all these uh, areas only if we are able to share the data between all these domains. And the ultimate aim for us is to develop personalized medicine strategies uh, so that we can make individual therapies for the patients. Uh, we are all also organizing since the past four years an international conference on blockchain in e-health. The fourth edition is uh, going to be on 9th of April next year. Please uh, look at our website and attend it. And for collaborations, please contact me via those emails or I will be around after the session. So thank you. The next uh, presenter is uh, Luis Miguel Pino from uh, the Polytechnic Institute of Porto. Okay, while we wait, I we can start. Um, so my name is Miguel Pino and I'm here representing the Polytechnic of Porto. So this is one of the biggest uh, uh, higher education institutions in Portugal. Uh, and basically what I'm here to present is our uh, competences and current activities uh, yep, in, the, in the framework of uh, the intersection of engineering and health. So basically we are setting up now uh, the fact that our, the campus of these two schools have joined. And so now we are setting up a complete uh, comprehensive uh, activities intersecting the work of uh, 10 research centers that work in, this, in these domains. So basically the activities that uh, we currently have are going from the uh, rehabilitation, so this is basically a physical rehabilitation but also psycho psychosociological rehabilitation. Uh, so in this concept is the prevention and also uh, uh, not only uh, how do I say, feedback and monitoring, but also how you can use rehabilitation, how you can help people to actually 
feel better said that you don't have to treat them because they don't feel better. Okay, I think this is one of the, the important aspects of being more preventive than curative. Also, the activities that we have going on in um, virtual reality, uh, games, for instance, to, uh, to the same preventive maintenance mode uh, of people, uh, in the environmental issues, um, if this works, uh, biomarker, so a lot of the information come from the genetic issues on the, on the people. Uh, we've heard that, and this can be crossed with then the physical uh, and monitoring data that's available afterwards, intelligent systems, and obviously embedded systems, Internet of Things, so everything that we can use to actually monitor, uh, non-invasively monitor uh, the, uh, the physical, the patterns of behavior of people. In terms of current activities, so basically the activities are going from physical rehabilitation okay, to uh, neurophysical, uh, physiological rehabilitation, uh, games, virtual real, uh, um, reality, um, how to use and observe patterns, both of human movement, but also uh, eyes interaction with, uh, uh, with the way you interact with the computer and the way you interact with uh, bots and all of that in order to, from that, assess the, uh, the mental state of, uh, of people, how they are, uh, hopefully how you can detect that very early so that you don't have to treat that uh, later on. So there's a, a very broad spectrum of, uh, of activities. So feel free to contact me either in this session or afterwards, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, Facebook, okay? So thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Enis Kayas uh, from Turkey. So let me briefly uh, start with uh, introducing myself uh, right here. Uh, so uh, I am a faculty member at the University. I'm coming from Istanbul, uh, and I'm an industrial engineer. Uh, so I'm more uh, interested in the efficiency of these systems. Uh, I have, we have been running some consultancy and research projects with some of the public and private universities, uh, private hospitals in Turkey, as well as the Ministry of Health. In particular, uh, we are working with operating room planning modules as well as chemotherapy patients screening. So uh, we are very heavily invested in healthcare economics or healthcare operations side. Uh, we are inter I am interested in this particular, um, the next one is, should be green, right? So uh, I am interested while well, they are trying to figure that one out. Let me briefly talk about um, uh, my main uh, contributions that I'm looking forward to participate in this particular call. Uh, as we know that uh, especially post-cancer care is uh, very important and requires a holistic view in the sense that it requires multiple stages of care as well as multiple stakeholders with generally conflicting uh, in, uh, incentives. So what we can do is we can create cost effectiveness analysis powered by predictive modeling strategies to compare various uh, prevention uh, alt um, alternatives. Or even better yet, we can create mathematical models that incorporates uh, all the incentives of the uh, multi multiple stakeholders as well as resource limitations while designing the best, perf des the best parameters of uh, prevention or monitoring strategy, and then we can use optimization to create, again, these, uh, these models. Um, again, uh, I have created a very little uh, short introduction, and uh, if you're interested about where I'm coming from, I'm coming from a, a third generation university established in Turkey, uh, and we, are, we have a strong background in uh, EU-funded research, and we have good supporting staff as well. If you are interested, you can contact me. Again, I will be here after the uh, session, and uh, you can always contact me via the email uh, or any other means. I will be in the conference for the full three days. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, originally, we had 
also in other presentation, but the presenters did not show up. I'm not sure if we have an additional presenter now. Yes, please, if you want to just come here, um, and if you have a USB stick with you, we can also show it, but otherwise you just do the presentation yes, without the slide. Um, maybe you can you just uh, quickly go to check with the technician yes, because uh, um, okay. Okay, so uh, be patient. This will be the, the last presentation, so I know that it has been a long day. So this is uh, Trelio. Okay, so uh, before I, I want to. Okay. Uh, my company is uh, IDRE, so we provide uh, services, consulting services uh, to companies, uh, startups, or small and medium enterprises. And uh, basically, we provide two kinds of services uh, access to public grant and consulting services, for example, uh, business model design and use of really innovative facilitation technique. Within our project, we selected for uh, this, uh, this event here in Vienna two projects. Uh, this one, uh, th the first one is Trilio. So uh, Trilio is aiming at solving the problem to connect the physical world with the digital world. So in a few words, um, is, a, uh, is a device, is an, it has been designed as, a, as an alarm, and uh, it has been designed thinking about uh, elderly people. So uh, normally the, the alarm is something that is really familiar for elderly. And um, is a tool that helps in uh, reaching a really high um, degree in uh, therapeutic adherence. So therapeutic adherence is the ability to follow a therapy. And no therapeutic adherence causes in Europe something like $80 billion um, damage every year. And this is a part of, a, of an ecosystem. So we are aiming to connect, for example, the practitioner, uh, the caregiver, that could be also a person from the family. Uh, you can uh, set up uh, an alarm, so at a given time, uh, the, uh, the clock reminds uh, the, per the person that has to take uh, a pill. You can also use, for example, the voice of a uh, nephew, so a grandpa remember to take the pill and whatever. And uh, you can also connect and collect the information, the data. There is another platform, this is the one that you see in uh, the bottom part. And this is available for caregiver, also for, uh, for public organization, managing this kind of issue. And um, Trilio uh, uh, has been awarded by the SME phase one project. Okay, so we just finished the feasibility study that has been submitted to the European Commission. And we are going to submit a phase two project uh, in the call of January. So we are looking for also a pilot project, pilot sites, and also for organizations that can help in distributing this solution all over Europe and the world. The company has already signed some contract with the Australia distributor and also with a company in India and some other are, uh, are to come. And we carry out two really small uh, pilot projects one in Spain with a Red Cross, uh, and the other one in, um, in Prague with the municipality of uh, Prague. Uh, so this is the first project. Now, uh, can you upload the, the second presentation that is Wally? This is another project that is uh, the counterpart of uh, Trilio, and uh, it is more dealing with uh, connecting um, an ecosystem uh, composed by a device. Uh, so it has been uh, uh, designed for um, uh, for the wellness sector. So you know, normally you have the problem that you, you're wearing uh, a polar, a Fitbit, or whatever. You change the device, and then you lose all the information, the data. Okay. So uh, Welly Village is aimed at solving this kind of problem, and uh, for sure it has been designed for the fitness sector. But if you uh, put on the left side all the device that you can use to monitor the blood pressure, uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever uh, kind of uh, data that you want to monitor, you can connect to the platform, and then you can uh, enable a kind of ecosystem where you have the, the consultancy. In our project is uh, the, um, let's say, the, uh, the, fin the fitness trainer, uh, the coach, but you can also have a doctor. And the whole system enable a kind of uh, blockchain system. You can create uh, Bitcoin, for example, once so you achieve a specific target, you have to lose weight or whatever, and uh, you can use this coin to buy something within the marketplace. For sure, this is a, a vertical on the um, uh, wellness sector, but you can also try to do some transformation to put it in, the, uh, in, a, in a project referring to the cancer treatment or whatever. Okay, um, 
uh, both systems are already, uh, already available. So tri they are starting selling Trilio. So the TRL is almost eight. This is our, uh, my contact details. So we'll be here also at the, at the end of the presentation. These are my contact details. And also you can see other um, business cases also in the, in the website of IDEARE. Thank you all. Thank you. So thank you very much. I think that was the last presentation. I just would like to remind you that interdisciplinarity is really important in our project. So make an effort that ICT and health and medical and uh, also uh, user engagement is really important there. Um, it's also good to have uh, SMEs on board. Um, of course, everyone has to play their own role uh, for the research coordination uh, action, it's really important to, to um, be very good on the excellence criterion and go beyond the state of the art. Um, therefore, it's normally necessary that research organizations participate in a project if it's about research there. Now that uh, were the presentations. I think the purpose really of this event that, that you network, so please make use of uh, these opportunities that you find here. Uh, and we look forward to receiving very, very good proposals from you. Thank you very much. <laughs>